Cervical cancer was one of the more common GYN cancers. The invention of the pap smear has significantly decreased cervical cancer because it catches the cancer at the pre-cancer stage. So let's take a look at the lifespan of a female. At 11, she hits puberty. 51, she hits menopause. Most cervical cancers occur in the reproductive age female. But some can occur postmenopause. And the way actual cancer is going to present in the reproductive age female is with postcoital bleeding. And any postmenopausal bleed is suspicious for a GYN cancer. But the reason why reproductive age females get cervical cancer and why it's almost never seen in the pre-reproductive age is because with the onset of menses comes the onset of sexual intercourse because cervical cancer is caused by HPV. Types 16, 18, and those in the 30s cause cancer. Just as a reminder, types 6 and 8 cause warts. And so you have to be sexually active in order to get HPV. But the presence of HPV causes inflammation, inflammation of the cervix, and then inflammation leads to cancer. So let's take a look at the progression of infection to cancer. This is the uterus. Initially, all that happens is there's infection of the cells at the basement membrane. Just a simple little inflammation. This is dysplasia. CIN1. If allowed to progress, these malignant looking cells still contained in the basement membrane fill the epithelial layer. This is CIN3, or carcinoma in situ. If allowed to progress even further, the cells break through the basement membrane and become full-blown active cancer, either an ectocervical lesion, that is, visible on pelvic exam, or an endocervical lesion, which may be missed by visual inspection. And so a female gets infected with HPV. That's her risk factor. It turns into dysplasia and carcinoma in situ, and then progresses to full-blown squamous cell carcinoma. This takes a number of years to occur because you have to be infected, undergo inflammation to dysplasia and then eventually to cancer and the type of cancer that cervical cancer is is squamous cell. Risk factors for getting HPV which is essentially a sexually transmitted disease is the number of sexual partners she's had and the presence of other STDs. At the point of dysplasia or carcinoma in situ we can catch it with a pap smear. Without the pap smear, there's no way of knowing that she has dysplasia. She won't feel it. And only after she develops full-blown cancer will she begin to experience postcoital bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding. So once you've diagnosed cancer, you have to stage it. And staging is done clinically, not surgically. Here again is the uterus, walls of the vagina, the cardinal ligament, and the pelvic sidewall. As a general rule, as the stage increases, 
the distance further down the vagina increases. To go from stage A to stage B, you move out. To go up stage, you go down the vagina. To go A to B, you go out. I'll show you what that means. Stage one, involves only the cervix itself. It has no involvement of the vagina, the cardinal ligament, or the pelvic sidewall. Stage two begins to involve the upper third of the vagina. And stage three involves all of the vagina. To go from stage 2A to 2B, there needs to be extension along the cardinal ligament towards the pelvic sidewall. To go from 3A to 3B, it must involve the pelvic sidewall. And stage 4 is when it leaves the GYN organs and moves on to others. Stage 4A involves bowel or bladder. And the worst form, stage 4B, is distant metastasis. But hopefully, you will detect cervical cancer before it gets to full-blown squamous cell carcinoma, that is, at a level of either carcinoma in situ or dysplasia. And if you do, you are going to do a colposcopy. And what you're going to look for is any sort of lesion on the surface of the cervix. And if you have an ectocervical lesion, you're going to do local destruction. You're going to prevent it from ever becoming a cancer to begin with. And that's done either with LEAP, which is essentially a hot wire that burns it away, or with cryo. If you have an endocervical lesion, you're going to perform what's called a cone biopsy. You're going to take out the endocervix. But in order to be able to do this, you have to know she's got a lesion. You have to know she's got dysplasia or carcinoma in situ. And so the way we do that is by screening for cervical cancer. And this is why the amount of actual cancer has significantly decreased. Hopefully, what will happen is that she will come in for an asymptomatic screen. And that asymptomatic screen is performed with the pap smear. There's been a lot of turmoil about when to begin. Most recent recommendations have made it incredibly easy. You begin at age 21. No more three years after initial onset of sex. At 21, you begin doing pap smears and you perform them every three years. New recommendations. The reasons for this is that it's found that in, in girls who are under the age of 21, they bounce. So what happens is they get infected with HPV, but they're more likely to clear it. So screening these girls actually increases the number of unnecessary procedures and puts them at risk for, say, an incompetent cervix from a cone biopsy and puts them through unnecessary stress. So a normal person can have pap smears at 21 for every year, and then if she's normal, switch to every Q three years. So if you have a pap smear, what can happen is it could be normal. Yay. She just goes on her normal routine screen. It can be, frankly, abnormal requiring additional investigation. Or it can be one of those, I don't know. It's atypical, but you're not really sure how significant it is. So let's first talk about ASGUS. If you found atypical cells, but it's not frankly abnormal, you have two options. The first is to do HPV DNA testing. Find out if she's got high risk HPV. If she does, you can then count it as abnormal. Or you can simply take a conservative approach and bring her back every three months to repeat the pap smear. 
Only if there is persistence of atypical cells on repeat PAPs does it become abnormal. If the HPV DNA testing shows a type that is not associated with cancer, or she clears two times in a row, she's considered normal. If there is HPV DNA testing of suspicious types of cancer, of virus that leads to cancer, or there's persistence of atypical cells, then it is abnormal. And so if ever you have frankly abnormal, or ASGUS that's turned abnormal, you then should reflexively perform the colposcopy. And the colposcopy gives you two things. It gives you an ectocervical sample as well as an endocervical sample. And if you find positivity on either test, it directs your next step. If ever there is a positive endocervix, you have an endocervical lesion, and you need a cone biopsy. If there's no endocervical lesion, but there is an ectocervical lesion, you have ecto only, and you can perform local destruction. And local destruction is the leap or the cryo. Now it's important to mention that CIN1, that dysplasia, is treated the same as ASGIS. And the whole purpose of the new recommendations is to decrease exposure of girls to unnecessary colposcopy because endocervical bi biopsy with a cone biopsy can lead to incompetent cervix. You don't want to put mom through the unnecessary stress and you don't want to put baby at risk when she eventually gets pregnant. So there was a lot of details in there. Let's finish by simply reviewing the highlights. The pathogenesis of cervical cancer is caused by human papillomavirus, especially type 16, 18, and those in the 30s. It leads to inflammation of cervical cells and eventually causes squamous cell carcinoma. The patient is going to be a reproductive age female who's going to present either as an asymptomatic screen on PAP or postcoital bleeding. You're going to diagnose the condition first with the pap smear. If that is abnormal or there's a fungating mass, you can do a colposcopy. If there's cancer, you stage it. And you stage it either with a CT scan or simply doing a physical exam. The treatment is dependent on what you find. If you have ASGUS or CIN1, you do the watch and wait. Watching and waiting means either HPV DNA testing or Q3 month pap smears. If you have endocervical biopsies that are positive, you do a cone biopsy. If you have an ectocervical lesion, you do local destruction. If you actually have full-on cancer and it's 2A or better, you do local resection, not destruction. You actually have to do surgery. If it's stage 2B or worse, you do debulking but then need chemo and radiation. Usually a platinum-based therapy. And finally, we've got prophylaxis. All girls at 13 should get Gardasil. Gardasil is the HPV vaccine that guards her from getting the types of HPV that cause cervical cancer. So that was a big overview of everything about cervical cancer. And that is cervical cancer. We make these videos for free and we need your help. Please donate because without your donations we can't make any more videos. Please donate.